Matthew McConaughey. Yeah. I did my 
tried to purpose too. My mom's gonna feel a whole lot better about the fact that I do that now. Thank you for validating me. Um, mega blockbuster you wish you'd started. Mega block. Well, there was one that I. <laughs> there was a rumor, and it is a rumor that that I got the Leonardo DiCaprio role in Titanic and turned it down. That is a lie. <laughs> <laughs> And I still to this day have said, going back to that eight, my agent at the time, I go, dude, this is true. You're in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> as far as I know, I auditioned and did not get the part. Um, that would have been, been a nice one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that just changes the way I view Titanic in so many ways. <laughs> <laughs> right? <laughs> I think it worked out how they did it as well. That's awesome. Okay, we're going to get uh, dig into more serious questions now. Um, your first big role was Dazed and Confused, and you described that as the best film school you've ever had. Yes. Which I think is fascinating, I'd love to know that, but the other thing I want to understand is, what made Richard Linklater take a chance on you? Because we've got 5,000 plus folks in this audience that are kicking ass in their jobs, are doing amazing things, engineers, software developers, you name it, leaders. We're all hoping somebody takes a chance on us in our careers. Yeah. Could you give us a little bit on that? Well, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a bit of a few things. One, I was in the right bar on the right night <laughs> with the right bartender who I knew who introduced me to a guy in the bar in Austin, Texas, who was in town producing a film called Days and Confused. I took the initiative to go down and speak to this man. And for a few hours, we got to know each other. By the end of the night, he asked me if I've ever done any acting. I'd been in like a Miller Lite commercial for yes. nothing that long. Um, and I said, you know, sure I have. And he said, well, you might be right for this part. Come to this address to get the script, which I did. There was, a, there was three lines in this script. Uh, I went home and worked on those three lines for two weeks. So I prepared really hard. And then <clears throat> I had the audition for Richard Lee Um And remember, I was a fraternity guy, as you know. We met on the fraternity <laughs> dance floor. So yes. I'm going to play, if you've ever seen Days Confused, Wooderson is a 21, 22 year old guy still hanging out at the high school because he likes yeah. the high school girls, right? <laughs> well, for me, in my mind, it was a job interview. So I like pressed my jeans, tucked in my shirt, shaved, and pulled my hair back and put it in there, and I looked like the frat guy, not like Wooderson, uh, the character I was reading for. And I remember going in there and talking to the director, and he was like, you're, 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 you're not this guy. You're not Wooderson. And I went, no, but I know who he is. He goes, who is he? And, I, and that's when I went. <clears throat> All right. <laughs> <laughs> and then, so, so what? I, so, Richard saw that I knew who the guy was, and um, I've learned from that very first audition what I've learned to do my job well. Which I think we can all. This is something that everyone can learn to do the job well. Don't act like one. Yeah. Be one. Yeah. Don't. You know, people don't want to hear us talk about things. Yeah. We can sell ourselves and yeah. advertise ourselves, but talks like fluff. Yeah. It's packaging for the product. I mean, don't act like whatever it is you want to be. Quit acting like one now and just start being one. Um, see it from the inside out. Be, be play it first person. Um, it, we're, we're not. You know, I, I realized very early on I was not in there to make new friends. Yeah. Richard Lee and I are friends now, but. We wouldn't be friends unless I had done a good job and he would have been cast to me. Yes. He didn't need a new friend. I didn't need a new friend. We weren't there to get along. We wanted to see someone who was right for that part. And I had the, I understood who Wooderson was and didn't act like him. I just started beating him and had one of the best summers of my life. And <laughs> three lines turned into three weeks work, um, which meant I kept getting invited back to set yeah. um, and thrown into scenes and riffing and improvising and that whole cast I had a team that was lobbing me lines in the middle of scenes yeah. that were not written so they the collaboration they pulled me in off of me uh, uh, you know enough things to do like I said to work for three weeks when it started off as three lines so I think Link better just saw his Wooderson and I was Wooderson uh, that's, that's amazing right? so one of the things that you probably wouldn't say, but I'd love to say about you, is that even when I was 18 years old and saw a lot of college frat guys, obviously, um, I remember very clearly how hard you studied in college. Yeah. I would see you with your backpack heading to mm -hmm. the library to go study whenever I was visiting in Austin, and, 
I mean, it could be on a Saturday afternoon. Yeah. You were heading there, and I thought, God, he's ready. hard. You got like a three nine GPA? Three eight two. Yeah. Um, and you know, funny thing, uh, uh, I just remembered. Uh, I went. I was headed towards law school, and when I wanted to change over to film school, I didn't have a piece of art to to show. I didn't have a film. I didn't have an acting reel or anything like that. But I had a three point eight two G. And that got me in just based on the GPA. Yeah. Um, so that's what all that study worked out for. Because then, once I got to film school, I really started learning a lot because I started making C's. <laughs> <laughs> As we know. <laughs> I just think it's awesome. I think it's a little known fact about you that. They... Well, I've always, I've always, I like to. Yeah. I'm, and then still today, I mean, if I do my job well, part of it is, a large part is because I will out prepare. Yeah. People. And, I, and I, I believe there are boundaries to freedom that you need to prepare to then be able to do your best at whatever you're going to do. It just takes away all the anxiety once you're in the game. If you're fully prepared, you can call an audible while it's live. Yeah. Anytime. Um, if you're not prepared, you're looking over at the, the sheet and wondering what to do or asking somebody else, and all of a sudden you missed the moment. Yeah. Um, just on this note, when I was interviewed for my first CMO job, in Silicon Valley with a 30 year old founder. Uh, I remember saying to him, what would be your biggest concern about putting me in this job? And he said, well, you've never done it. And I was like, yeah, you're, you're right. And I said, uh, he's like, what's your biggest concern? And I was like, that I'm gonna fuck this up really bad. And so he kind of looked at me and I said, but I'm gonna bust my ass making sure that I don't every right. single day of the week. And I said, what you can count on is a lot of hard work and preparation. Well, there, there you go. Yeah. And you just said something that a lot of people I don't think recognize or should recognize. You would have been embarrassed if you would have fucked it up. That's right. I would have embarrassed my mom. I think we could use a little more embarrassment. Yeah. For people that don't want to be embarrassed. No doubt. To go, why are you doing it? Because I don't want to fuck it up. That's right. Wait, for everyone else, no, for me, uh -huh. I don't want to. I'll have trouble sleeping at night if I fuck this up. That's right. Because I'll be like, damn it, Carrie. Yeah. You know? And I, I think we can all use a little more of that. It's so true. It's so if true. You don't know what to do. <laughs> call it process of elimination. If you don't know exactly what you want to do, at least don't do what you, you know you don't want to do. That's you right. You don't want to fuck it up. Just if you, if you if you don't know how to win, just try not to lose. That's right. You're at least one step closer to winning. <laughs> That's absolutely right. Okay, your career has been remarkably diverse from Dallas Fires Club, which you won an Oscar for, and deservedly so. That was an amazing, amazing performance. Um, to contact, to the wedding planner, to a time to kill, and my personal favorite, True Detective. <clears throat> yeah, what do you look for in roles, given how diverse and broad you've gone, um, and what characters and narratives capture your attention? In the last 12 years, I've really been looking for roles that scared me, <laughs> that truly scared me, yeah. that I was like, oh, what am I going to do with this yeah. guy? Um, but I can't wait to find out mm -hmm. who he is, um, that character. Um, characters that have a singular obsession, mm -hmm. characters that are sort of outcasts, that live on the fringes a little bit, that don't pander to society's mores, or, uh, um, you know, that. that i played a lot of um, anti-heroes, and I think part of that's because it's much easier. The, the, the anti-hero actually has more identity than the hero a lot of times. You know, and a lot of times, I'm not interested in heroes that try to be everything to everybody. Um, and a lot of times, that's how they're written on the page and scripts that I've, that I've found. Mm -hmm. um, so people with a, with a, with a singular obsession, um, that live on the fringe, that don't really pander to the masses, um, and aren't afraid to die. Um, just one note on Dallas Fires Club. My uh, husband's beloved uncle passed away of AIDS in the 80s alone. Um, and I just want to thank you for what that film did for continuing to bring light to a topic and bring compassion and empathy. Yep. Um, I also sponsor the Pride organization uh, at Splunk and proudly, we all need allies. And uh, I thank you for what you did in that movie for my brethren of the Pride community. So. It was my honor that Ron Woodruff and that, that entire story was one that needed to be told.
uh, most people wouldn't consider the role of technology in filmmaking and what it plays, um, especially when you see all the creative greatness that comes out on screen. But how has technology changed the movie industry? I and mean, we think of like Rotten Tomatoes and social, you know, social sentiment, and even you know the making animated films like Sing. I've watched it probably 40 times with my kids. No joke, I love it. Yeah. Um, my kids love it. You're making Sing Two yes, right now. Sing two, right? Thank you. Uh, it gives me another. I got my kids watch. out here too. Talk about that one. I know a lot of those films you were talking about, Dallas Buyers and True Detective and Killer Joe. I haven't made many that my kids can see, so <laughs> it was time to go make one like Sing for the, for the youngsters. Um, well, yeah, one, you look at how far animations come. Yeah. Um, but in the, in the physical making of a, even a live action film, there's just so much more you can do in post now. Mm -hmm. I mean, Think about it, you used to shoot on film. You didn't know what you had until you developed that film. And then you had to look at it and you were already moved on. You couldn't go back and reshoot it. Mm -hmm. You can see playback right away. You can go back and see if what you were intending to do is what you actually did, if it is actually what you captured. Yeah. Um, you can also fix things in post, which we have to watch because some of us can be a little bit lazy and go not be as discerning on the set, because we can go, ah, we'll fix it in post. Like that's one of the, uh, that, that line gets thrown around a little too haphazard, then ah, we'll fix it in post, ah, we'll fix it in post. Um, but then, you know, you talk about like what Rotten Tomatoes and the platforms and things where Metacritics and, yeah. I mean, you all know better than I am, as information is freely shared and how transparent the world is <laughs> now. There's not as many secrets. Um, there's, you know, a movie can be made, you know, now, if you don't open up your film the first weekend, you're done. When I first started, a film would come out and you would build, it would build momentum if it was good and getting traction over the weeks. Um, one, two, three, four weeks, maybe peak its, uh, it's, it's box office income over a weekend. On the fourth weekend, that doesn't really happen. That happens one in a million now. Um, part of that's due to these technological platforms that sort of almost can sometimes tell you what the movie is before you've gone into it or tell you how to think about that. Yeah. Um, and, that and that'll mean that's the difference that a lot of people are gonna get out and go pay for a ticket. Or the other things today, the streaming. Yeah. You used, when I was, when I was first started, it was you made a movie and then it came out, you got to maybe see the blockbuster <laughs> go rip something five, six months later. Now it's almost immediate. You you know you, you can go to the theater or you can watch it, stream it in your in your home Sunday night while it's in the theater. Um, and that's one of the challenges that that, that the whole film industry that we're going through. Um, do they help each other? Does the streaming, immediate streaming, is it an assist to the theatrical release? Is it a deterrent? Um, I think that they, that they that they assist each other. Can. But they definitely trespass on yeah. each other's territory. Do you read social media? Ever? Do I do social media? Yeah. No, but I'm a, I'm I'm curating my first dive into it <coughs> right now. <laughs> we uh we had uh, the great privilege of hosting uh, former President Barack Obama mm -hmm. a month ago, and uh, he said that he actually stays the hell away from social media. Um, so it was it was an interesting commentary on. I'm immensely curious uh, because I love the tool. Uh -huh. um, I just don't know how interested I am in having a dialogue. I am interested in having a monologue. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen Rob Lowe's Twitter feed where his kids just rag on him every time he puts up a photo where he doesn't have a shirt on? No, I have You have to go look it up. It's he's so funny. funny. He's funny and his kids are funnier. And he, does that guy keep getting younger? <laughs> and better looking? Every time. It's, or good filters on his camera. It's in reverse or something. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. But you please go check it out. It might scare you away from doing social okay. media. Uh, okay. Uh, you now dedicate a lot of your time to giving back, which I love. Uh, with your JK Living Foundation, teaching at the University of Texas. Uh, Thank you for making a difference in the lives of the next generation of leaders and humans. And I, I just think it's really awesome and it actually really matters. Um, but I do 
want to know, um, do the students actually call you Professor McConaughey? Yeah. <laughs> Does that feel weird? It's kind of getting the hang of it. <laughs> <laughs> Is there an age limit to join, come in your class? No, you just have to be a master's film student. We take 35 students. But, um, but like, can someone audit your course that's not a full-time student at the University of Texas that's like 85 years old? Sure. Because my mom has some friends in Austin at her senior living community that have been talking about wanting to audit your Come class. On. Okay. Come awesome. on. I'll, I'll tell her you can tell her friends. Absolutely. She'll be the most popular gal at Longhorn Village. Um, do you have an attendance or tardy policy? <laughs> Hasn't needed one yet. We're packed at 35, and everyone seems to be on time. They like the class. They say it's really fun, um, and it is. It's a. It's a. Um, so it's a class that I wish I would, I wish I would have had mm. when I was in college. You said earlier, like I said, going on the film set of Days and in three weeks was the best film class I ever had. Yeah. Well, in film school, you learn theory, you learn the history of narrative, you study films, but you don't do so much getting out and learning the practical side of how film is actually made. So yeah. about 10 years ago, I noticed how different the final product, the final films I would make, how different they were from the original script. So the film, the, the class is called Script to Screen, and we chronologically, uh, uh, with the students, show them, here's the original script, have a look at it, declare what you think it would be. Now we show them the next script, and they see cuts, they see rewrites, they challenge why, they say if they agree with them, disagree with them, what? We give them the next script, more changes. We give them the next script, all of a sudden they're like, wait a minute, where'd that great action sequence go at the end that I love so much? We're like, well, that was going to cost $1.2 million. And the director and the producers decided they would rather shoot on location in Rome at the Vatican than on a studio lot. And they wanted to spend that money on that location. And so they cut that big action sequence. And yeah. so, and then they see the shooting script. So they think, ah, that's it. This is what the movie's going to be. Huh? Well, then they find out that there's a first assembly. The editors have gone in and made a completely different movie than the shooting script. And then we show them the film. So it's, it's a bit of putting some science to the magic of how a film's made. Because obviously, like any job, you have to have an aim when you set out, but you also have to be able to adapt along the way. And I did not understand the adapt adaptation part of creating when I was in film school. And that's what this class does. That's so fun. How many days a week? It's three days a week. Okay, and then last thing, what are you hoping that your students take away from their experience in your classroom outside of what you just mentioned? Just, just that, the practical, experiential yeah. learning. I mean, what you, what y'all's line you have here right now? Doing? Yeah, turn data into doing. Data into doing. Uh -huh. yeah. What good is data without the doing? You couldn't have said it better. So, <laughs> thank you. You know, I mean, so, <laughs> that's what, the, that's what the, the students should hopefully get out of the class is, I mean, I, I, you know, I have a lot of tests that I took in school in college, and like I say, if you ask me the questions for those tests now, I'd say, I don't know, but I passed that test. <laughs> <laughs> what I remember is my experiences. What I remember yes. is my internship. What I remember is when we had to go shoot the film and find the location in class and actually make it happen and fail mm -hmm. and look at it and go, oh, jeez, this is crap. But you know what I'm going to try again? That's what I remember, the experiences. And so I, 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 I think it's very important that the students and, and all of us get the experiential side. And I'm always telling them, oh, you need to fail more. You need to fail more. I've got, I've got a line that is really kind of resonating with me lately, is that it's not a risk unless you can lose the fight. And we're so, yes, we can be embarrassed, as we talked about, we should be. We don't, we, we don't be happy with failing, but I think we can all fail a little bit more. No doubt. It's a... Uh... Try it. <laughs> See, you know, a lot of times you find out, try it, screw it up. It actually, it's harder than you thought to screw it up. <laughs> it's uh, it's something I hope my kids learn early and often because I've seen too many people in uh, high high pressure Silicon Valley not want to fail and they're in their 40s and have never had a major failure in it. I'm, I'm like, ah, we got to create an environment, a world where people can fail and get back up again yes. and face the next day with some sense of dignity and say, I'm going to go back at it harder. And all over, as you were talking about platforms earlier, yeah. we, we've got horrible 
human manners on these on these, a lot of these platforms. Yeah. We love to point our finger at disease or failure rather than than health. But as you're saying, yeah, I mean, we don't. Nobody has this thing called life figured out. No. <laughs> and if someone's going to take a risk and try, and doesn't want to fail, but maybe they do, it's not constructive at all to pile on. At least they gave it a shot. No, you know, no. and let's do it again. Let's try it again. Because if so many people are more and more afraid to fail because they're like, I'm gonna be, I'm going to be embarrassed or I'm gonna be chastised by my peers or by the millions of people that don't even know me on my social platform. That's right. Um, and people are kind of that's why they're embracing almost less in life, but more in data and only data sometimes. Um, I think yeah. <laughs> fail more and support those who take the risk and try. That's right. That's right. That's right. Right. That's right. Uh, speaking of our doers, and we just rolled out a month ago our new our new branding and turned data into doing as our new tagline because people in this audience are doing amazing things with data. They are using our platform, but helping global law enforcement in countries get ahead of human trafficking, yep. saving lives. They are. There's. We just invested uh, with our new venture fund in a company called Zone Haven. They were on a stage this week with our president and talking about their technology is helping firefighters with their sensors and reading off those sensors understand when wildfires are started much earlier. Sometimes they can alert the firefighters 30 to 45 minutes earlier than they would have known elsewise. Okay. Um, they're tracking burn patterns so they can get safer routes out of uh, wildfires, which are a big issue in California, as you and I both yeah. know. Um, so the people in this room are hunting hackers, doing really cool things with data, and they're really heroes behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. um, so I know a lot happens in movies behind the scenes. What, who are your heroes in your industry that do the real magic behind the scenes that don't get the kudos as much as they probably should? Well, look at my position, and I learned this early on in that first film, um, because I went to film school and understood who the grips were, who the electricians were, who the caterers were, who the director of photography was, who the PAs were. I remember the first time I was in the front of the spotlight in front of the camera. And it's all made to feel like, oh, you do this, you're the one. There's no one else behind the camera. They're, they're, they're the invisible ones. You go see a film and you go like, oh, you made that yesterday. It's kind of, oh, we made that a year ago and it took four months and that, script was in development for six years before making it and certain producer got a hold got the right to that story 12 years ago worked up their own money to get that script written to get someone else to look at it and 2,000 people to go no we want nothing to do with it but they held on to it and they kept going no I believe in this there's something here yeah. they kept peddling it kept going to studios kept going to financers we're told no again 2,000 times, and finally someone goes, hey, I think I see what you see, or something of it. You know what, I'll, let's, 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 let's give that a chance. Even then, there's quite a few hurdles to go through. What's this gonna cost? I mean, I tell the story of the Dallas Fires, but we had the rights to that. I was attached to that for six years. Nobody wanted to make that movie with Matthew McConaughey. They wouldn't make it. I get a call eight days before we're about to shoot from Jean-Marc Vallée, our director. He says, Mathieu, we, uh, we're supposed to have seven million dollars to make this film. And I only have 4.9, it's going to be impossible. But um, if you will be <laughs> on the set in eight days, I will be there too. And so I showed up and he showed up. He cut the grip department. No lights on the entire thing. We had to say we didn't have that two point, or three point one million dollars. Two point one million dollars. And we shot it with no lights. Just because we said, we're going to go make it. We didn't flinch. We didn't ask permission. And we went and made it for $4.9 million in 25 days. Wow. Just because people were like, we don't care. Wow. So the people, you know, the people that, that, that are at the inception, the producer that saw it, the person that read it and said, I, this is a story that I think should be told. I'm going to be behind this. And maybe I'll get my name called and, 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 and be on some stage 15 years from now if this thing does well, but that's not why I'm doing it. Yeah. I'm doing it because I want to tell this story and I want to help get the people together to tell it. I'd hook her bike, Brooke. 
let's go make it. Those, those people you never even heard of. That you're not gonna, I'm not, I'm not up there holding that, that gold man of a trophy unless those people did the, did the, the plowing for years to get me to that point, for me to at least have the opportunity to get to that point. It's total team sport. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, my favorite topic, I love being a mom. It's, uh, mm -hmm. even when I was interviewing for this job, I remember talking to our CEO about it. I was like, hey, so I just want to be really clear. I've got young kids and we're in the red zone. Like, they're at an age where they can't really watch themselves and they really kind of need their mom, so is that okay? And I knew Smoke was a company for me the moment he opened his mouth and said, are you kidding? Family first here. And they really treat me as though that's the case. And it's, it's a wonderful place to be because I can be a mom and a working mom and, and do both. And I also know, and I'm sure you probably know that parenting is one of the most humbling things that's ever happened to me, as well as the most awesome. <laughs> and, uh, when we had President Obama with us, we asked him the question, what parenting had taught him? And he crushed the answer, so uh, no pressure. But <laughs> what has parenting taught you? Oh, uh, well, first of all, I'm not being any parent. Well, second, this, every day, the truth is put in your face that it's more DNA than environment. <laughs> That's yep. one thing. Um, you know, they are who they are. We can shepherd them. We can nudge them. We can put what they're turned on by in front of them more. Yeah. Let them negotiate things more on their own to eliminate the things that are not of their essence. Um, it also, for, for me, is you immediately start, as a, as, a, as a man, as a father, as a person, I immediately started going, oh, I need to start living my legacy now. <laughs> what, what, what are you waiting on, McConaughey? Because, you know, you, you, you get married, it's different than dating. You get married, you're living now for the future. Well, when you have children, you actually are, they're living the future, the physical future. Yes. So you better start living your legacy now because the shadow you're leaving is them. I can go, as Steven Spielberg said this great quote, I can go, we can go make you know, 5,000 great movies, but there's only one epic. That's your children. And that's your shadow. That's the story that we did. That's the legacy that we're living as parents that is, it will embody us for the rest of time after we're long gone. You know? And after they're long gone, hopefully they have children that will live on their legacy. So in that way, life is, is, is a verb, and, and, I, and I, the quicker we can say, hey, I'm gonna start living my legacy now and making legacy choices for myself yeah. and for my family, the better. I don't think there's any time you can do that too soon. Obviously, it's not hard to know. Yeah. It is hard to, to know what, what is my legacy, what, 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 who am I, who do I, who do I wanna be? Um, but when you do, don't, don't delay the choices that create more of that for you and your family. Uh, I think you and President Obama are tied. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great answer. Um, so nicely done. Uh, <laughs> interestingly, interestingly y'all's answers are very similar. Okay. You talk about how you can't, you know, DNA is DNA, and you talk about how your yeah. daughter's one of them's just like him and one's just like Michelle. Right. And he said that you, the one that's like Michelle and Michelle basically run our household and we know our places in the world. <laughs> so it was, it was pretty darn funny. Okay, so uh, I am, I'm, people probably know and most people know if they've paid any attention to your career that you are a rabid Texas Longhorn football fan and all things uh, Texas Longhorn. Yes. We've got some Longhorns in the audience, some Slunkers who are Longhorns, so say hello. Um, but your team is playing my team this weekend. Yes. And Texas Fish and Horn Frogs. <laughs> and I'm as rabid about the Horn Frogs as you are about the Longhorns. So I'm curious, um, any game day predictions for Saturday? <laughs> Gentlemen's bet? Gentlemen's <laughs> ladies bet, absolutely. Um, well, you, you guys have had our number. Gary Patterson and CCU Horn Frogs have kind of had our number here at the past five, six years. Um, and you're actually, I think you might even be favored by a point. Really? Surprise. Is that because of the Kansas game last weekend? It's Kansas game, but it's also, 
how you guys have really had our number over the last five or so years. You've beaten us in Fort Worth, you've beaten us in Austin. Um, I think we're a different team this year. I don't, you know, we're not, we're not going to win a national championship, but I don't think we're going to lose a game that we should win. Yes. And I think we should win. <laughs> <laughs> so I see a close game. I see us winning 24. No, no, not 24 20. That's not near enough points. Jeez, oh man. Um, 34 30. Um, that's very gracious. What do you say? Uh, <laughs> I really like Gary Patterson. He's the greatest coach ever. But we have a freshman quarterback who's having a hard, really hard time hitting the broad side of a barn. So I think um, we've been allowing about 580 yards of offense a game. <laughs> and a lot of those are passing yards. Um, I'm just going to say our kicker isn't real accurate either. So I think we're going to have a hell of a time putting any points on the board. I say it's going to be 38 to 17. You and I, I, I it hurts me to say that, okay. I but I, I got to be intellectually honest. I, I'm like not feeling, I'm not feeling very confident about this. Huh? No, we will see. Okay, talk Thank about you. this next year. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> and what has been your most special moment being involved with the Longhorn Athletic System? I mean, 2005 when, the, when we won the national championship, yes, I mean, that was the, 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 the pinnacle. Everyone, I don't know if everyone. Anyone remembers that game, the Long Orange versus the dynasty of USC. All the talk was, you know, this the third national championship, the greatest college team ever. Yep. And um, we went in the Rose Bowl and, 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 and beat them. We had Vince Young, who was almost like having 14 players against 11. Yeah. And um, I knew from the first tip, from the very first hit of that game, was, oh, yes, oh, yes. <laughs> And they were here to play too, um, and it was that's actually probably the best. I mean, I think sports is the best reality television there is, and that was I've never seen better reality TV than that game. I was there. I had my head down the last five minutes of the game, saying "Hail Marys" over and over. And oh over. yes, <laughs> I remember didn't even look at the field. Oh, and, and, and I've watched that game on TV since. And the commentator still never gave us a chance until like midway through the fourth quarter. They were finally like, well, I think we've got a game here. Yeah. <laughs> it's been that <laughs> no shit, we've got a game time. here. Yeah. <laughs> that was, an, it was literally an amazing moment. So I agree with you on that. Okay. Um, I know we're pretty close to out of time, but before we wrap up, um, I understand that on November 4th, you've got a big day coming up. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Mr. McConaughey's turning 50. Can you believe it? Yeah. <laughs> Happy early birthday. Thank you. Um, what's one piece of wisdom you'd leave with us or call to action for this room of leaders and doers? Okay. Um, what, what has 50 years taught you that you'd love to leave with us? Uh, let me say a couple. Because this first one is something that I think I don't want to be misconstrued with your actual occupations, but personally in life. Maybe this is a better way to take this one if you care to. Um, remember Monty Wills? Oh, of course I did. Uh, he's a friend of ours in college that was probably on that dance floor, maybe not as well. Out from Alabama, his great grandfather told him at 98 years old, on his porch, he went home one summer, he was sitting with his great grandfather. He goes, Papa, oh, what's, what's the best 